Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is edifying to me to see such interest in our wonderful Pine Barrens. I was fearful that with a, an 11 o'clock in the morning hour for the program on a Wednesday that it would just be me and my colleague Tom and the crickets. <laughs> but uh, it's just great to have everyone out here. So I'm Paul Schopp. I'm the Associate Director of the South Jersey Culture and History Center at Stockton College. And uh, I'm happy to uh, present to you today pine wine, four samplings poured from the exhibition up in Gallery One. If you haven't seen it yet, I invite you to stay behind after the program and take a look at it. I think you'll find it very enjoyable. So in an effort to provide you with information that could not be imparted through the exhibition panels upstairs, I've selected four topics for further exploration. Dr. James Still, the early botanist, the life and culture of charcoal, and the dance craze of the Pine Barrens. As much as possible, you'll hear the voices of the people directly involved or the witnesses of it. My own verbiage will be minimized in deference to some amazing historic narrative. So as an introduction of Dr. James Still to you, I would like to specifically address his formative years in the Pines. If you've not read his autobiography, Early Recollections and Life of Dr. James Still, you should put it at the very top of your reading list. I consider it American sacred scripture, and it should be required reading for all school students. James Still entered the world on April 9, 1812, the son of Levin and Charity Still. Levin changed his, uh, his name, uh, I'm sorry, Levin and Charity Steele. Levin changed his name to Still in a further attempt to conceal his fugitive wife's identity. James, James's mother found it odd and foreboding that James's mouth already contained two, ne two teeth at his birth. Based on census work, it appears James may have received his given name from one of his father's brothers as a free man of color named James Steele lived in Caroline County, Maryland in 1820. After James' birth, Levin relocated his family about a mile into the woods at the Thompson Place, where they remained for about a year. The Still family then moved again, taking up residence with an elderly black man named Cato in an effort to save money and improve the life of this old homeowner. Cato's house comprised an old log cabin, one story high containing an open attic, a single entry door, a large fireplace, and no glazing to fill the fenestration. James reported his earliest recollections occurred at Cato's house, where his father, seeking to care for James, bought him a pair of shoes from Lumberton that did not fit and had to be returned uh, to the factory. James cried bitterly at the thought he would not get to keep the shoes. Despite this display of tears in his autobiography, James suggests he was a happy child during his early years. When James had surpassed his third birthday, Dr. John Fort of Medford arrived at the log cabin to vaccinate the still children. Observing the physician using the small double-edged scalpel on each child to inject live culture virus totally captivated James. He writes, quote, from the moment I was inspired with a desire to be a doctor, it took deep root in me, so deep that all the drought of poverty or the lack of education could not destroy that desire. From that day, I did not want any knowledge save that of the healing art. It grew with my growth and strengthened with my strength. My thinking faculties were aroused, and I soon commenced to practice. Among the children, I procured a piece of glass and made virus out of spittle. I also procured a thin piece of pine bark, which I substituted for a lancet. This was the little acorn, which was intended to become an oak, thrown into the thicket, not knowing whether it should ever again be seen or heard from. But there was one, unseen, who cared for and watered and protected it." End quote. After the family had lived with Cato for a year or two, Levin's hard work paid off with enough money to save to uh, purchase a parcel of land priced at from one to three dollars an acre. And he built his own homestead. Like Cato's house, Levin constructed a single story log house with one entry door and no glazed sashes. James described his father as very industrious. 
But the number of children overwhelmed his ability, numbered in uh, 14 altogether, his ability to pro provide for them. So James watched his older siblings become servants and laborers at the homes and farms of more affluent area residents. He states, quote, I, at that time, was only a consumer and not a producer. So it became my turn to stay at home and delight myself in playing about the yard and looking forward to the time when I should, like Dr. Fort, be riding around, healing the sick, and doing great miracles. These thoughts would come over me with an enrapturing sense. Strange to say, I never delighted in toys or playthings or childish sports. Time passed on and I came to be eight or nine years old when I was put to work chopping wood and getting rails in the cedar swamp and making charcoal. In the summer, we picked huckleberries and in the autumn, cranberries, end quote. Levin came to own 40 acres of land, which he farmed with the aid of his children. Levin planted corn, rye, potatoes, and vegetables. To till the soil, Levin employed a, a horse and a yoke of oxen. During the winter, the older boys usually cut and split hundreds of cords of wood. As noted in the quote above, James and his siblings went cranberry picking, picking often at the, quote, celebrated at Zion Cranberry Meadows, located five or six miles south. These meadows invited quite a number of promiscuous pickers. And as there was no restriction in those days, they were a source of profit to all those who engaged in the industry. They were owned by Samuel Richards, who carried on the foundry business in at Zion, but whose residence was in Philadelphia, end quote. When James reached the age of 10, his father obtained a yoke of oxen for the farm, and it fell to James to help his father in driving the pair. Quote, when I was about 10 years of age, father bought a yoke of oxen, and it became my lot to drive them with him. Of this new business, I was very proud at first, but it soon became a source of great vexation for me. We used to cart wood to Medford, and the oxen were so slow, it appeared to me that I should die of tire. Our condition, though, was changed for the better, for we used to carry our provisions on our backs. But now we could cart it on the wagon. Oh, how many have lived and died without knowing anything of the rugged road the poor of the world have to travel. Often half starved for food, half naked, barefooted, with no one to look up to but a poor, dejected father who feels the same sting. Our house at this time was surrounded by forest, and only now and then a habitation near. With deer, the wild deer were plenty, and many people took great pleasure in hunting them for sport and for food. Bears also inhabited the neighborhood. I remember when three of them passed through my father's field, not more than 100 yards from the house, and walked about under an oak tree in search of acorns, and their tracks were visible the next morning. The fox, the raccoon, the grouse were all inhabitants of our wild forest, all of which have now given place to the husbandmen. The Indians who used to be seen in scores traveling through the wood and the marks of whose axes were left on many a white oak, trying, to, uh, trying, uh, trying its quality for basket stuff, are all gone, some to their last resting place and others to foreign climes to be heard from no more forever." End quote. After James turned 11, his older brother Samuel left the homestead and went to work for Aaron Engel. On that day, James reflected, quote, that was a soul-trying day for me, the day my brother left, and parting with him almost broke my heart. As he was the oldest, I always had some, someone to lean on, but now all was gone, end quote. In his formative years, James was quite so somber, quote, at this period, I neither learned song nor dancing. Mirth of all kinds was unpleasant to me. I had a great love for truthfulness and was very fearful of the devil and ghosts, particularly at night. I was also afraid of Indian Job. He was a tall man, I think six feet and six inches high. He would often get drunk and go whooping about in Indian fashion, which was a great terror to me. Job was killed finally. A wagon containing a cord and a quarter of green oak wood passed over him in one of his drunken frolics. I was at first elated at this, but afterwards came to consider that a dead man 
or his ghost would be more difficult to evade than a living one. The matter so disturbed me that at night I scarcely dare stir from the house for fear of seeing him. I only quieted myself by thinking that it did not appear I would call upon, that if he did appear, I would call upon the Lord to deliver me. Although I sometimes doubted if he would do this, so great a sinner did I feel myself to be. I recollect one night that his son Job and myself went to meeting. And as we were standing outside of the door, we heard a shrill sh shout, which seemed to come from the graveyard where old Job was buried. Young Job said to me, that's daddy. The young man's experience together with my own fears was like a thousand daggers driven through my heart. And great, great horror seized me. I trembled in every muscle and sweat from every pore. We went into the meeting house and I watched the door and windows expecting to see old Job enter, but he did not come in. In the walk home, I feared we would meet him. And as the reader may imagine, I should find myself in that case, no better off. My father sent me to the same schoolhouse where the meeting had been held at another time in the evening to get the master's spectacles. I had to obey him, no daring to say no, lest he would manifest his love to me in a scriptural fashion. So I went along with my heart rising in my throat. When I came to the door, I stopped to listen, just for a moment, to see if all was all right. Hearing nothing, I made a rush at the door with the key in my hand, unlocked it, pushed it open, flew into the desk, seized the spectacles, ran out of the house, and started home. When I reached the edge of the hill where an old house had once stood, but now in ruins, I saw a broken brick and a large scent sticking up from the ground. I grabbed the coin, ran for my life, and where fairly out of danger, thought I had better repa had been repaid for my trouble. I mention these things that my younger reader may see the untrained imagination will lead one from the right way, end quote. The last sentence of this quote provides the essence of why James authored an autobiography. He sought to educate the younger generation with life lessons and provide a bomb for the injuries they might encounter throughout the span of their years. The thought of becoming a doctor always remained steadfast in James's mind. Quote, as I advanced in years, the horizon of my life widened, my vision expanded, and things began to look more beautiful. The thought of Dr. Fort's Lancet would run through my mind and set me to musing. Can it be that I will ever become a doctor? If so, how will I obtain information or to whom shall I go? Then I would think I know no black doctors and white ones will not instruct me and I have not the means to defray my expenses at college. As I chopped wood, thus I would muse, wishing the time to roll around where I should be a man. <laughs> Despite or perhaps because of his father's very harsh discipline, James became strong, sober, and somber as he matured. When his father hired James out to Israel Small for a month to dig potatoes and husk corn, James learned to play dominoes with the entire Small family. The whole family played, and I played with them, and I never played again after leaving there. As he stated in a previous quote, he took no pleasure in frivolity. As a sure sign of his maturation process, he wrote, quote, I was very determined in everything I undertook, and I always knew where to find a thing that belonged to me. If it had been disturbed by no one else, my knife or other things, I never lost as most boys did. I formed a habit of doing anything at the time appointed for it to be done. If I promised to do a thing, I did it. If I had to go anywhere, I was always on time. There was nothing like present time to me, and if I commenced to do a thing, I would finish it. I never ate except when hungry, and then if in a hurry or busy, would scarcely take time for that, end quote. James grew restless at home due in large measure to his father's continued heavy-handed discipline. So his father bound James out to Amos Wilkins of Foster Town at the age of 18 for a period of three years, two months, and, three day, and uh, five days. At the end of James's service, Levin would receive $100, and James would be handed $10 and a new suit of clothes. During his time at the Wilkins farm, he quickly learned to like rum, and then just as quickly gave it up, and vowed to remain temperate for the remainder of his days. 
While engaged in singular activities ranging from plowing to carting wood, James would often daydream, sometimes almost to the point of entrancement about his future life as a physician. Quote, I always had more time for contemplation, being often alone plowing in the field or carting from the woods. How many times have I seen visions of my future course open to me? At times I was entirely absorbed by these visions and it would appear to me that I was practicing medicine with great success. I could see my patients come from all parts of the country, the lame on beds, consumptives almost gone. So great seemed to be the number that I had not time to attend to all of them. All kinds of diseases imploring my help. Many seemed given over by skillful physicians, yet I treated them with success. So the astonishment of, to the astonishment of all who beheld. I seemed in my vision too to be riding over the country, healing the sick. Some sang my praise, others derided me. I often could not tell whether the visions were fancy or prophecy. Of this I leave the reader to judge. At these times I would frequently be in ecstasies, not able to tell when I came to the field or how long I had been there, until the horn aroused me by summoning to uh, dinner. I would sometimes blame myself for these mental states and resolve never to give way to them again, but I was not able to control them and would only resolve to find myself launched again on the ocean of my imagination without rudder or compass or anyone to guide. I had hoped only as an anchor and a faith in him who rules all things, believing he would bring my frail bark back to its desired haven." End quote. As you are no doubt aware, James did become a naturopathic physician, collecting and growing his own herbs and plants in, Cro in Crossroads, Medford Township, and compounding them there at his office. His success as a doctor and a real estate investor offered him considerable riches and fame. When he died, he was one of the wealthiest men in Burlington County and probably the wealthiest man of color in New Jersey. Well, we'll move on to our botanists, and our first early botanist is none other than Philadelphia's own John Bartram who wrote a letter describing a trip into the Pine Barrens during May of 1736. Addressed to Peter Collinson, I engaged an owner a part of a cedar swamp for my guide, without whom I could hardly have found it. We traveled about 12 miles beyond the inhabitants over deserts of sand and such deep miry swamps that sometimes both we and our horses had much ado to get out. The sand lies in ridges 40 or 50 or 60 poles over, and the swamps lie between, which are the heads of rivers and brooks. But so thick set with shrubs and bushes, about 10 poles wide, that we had great difficulty in passing these swamps. At last, we came to the head of Egg Harbor River, where the great cedar swamp began, containing many hundred acres, cheaply producing white cedar but in some drier places, silver laurel or bay maple, holly and sassafras, and about the ridges some pines, but I observed no red cedar. The white grows only in wet places, often knee deep in water in wet season. They grow near together, the small ones within a foot or two of one another, a white cedar or two inches diameter will be 20 feet high. The larger trees grow all at 10 or 20 feet distance, which makes them grow very tall. A tree of two feet diameter at the, at the hump will be 80 or 100 feet high and 30 or 40 feet without a limb. The soil where they grow I take to be clay, but the surface is a mat of roots, all interlaced one with another, which entangles the leaves and rubbish and makes a bog. Um, the, uh, the bark of the root is red which gives a tincture to the waters that run from them, but the taste is good and sweet. Uh, our ceterac and uh, sar sar sarsaparilla grows at the roots where the sun is rarely seen so thick is the shade above. The leaves, not so long and prickly as the red cedar, the fruit is coniferous and seed very small. To satisfy your immediate curiosity, I enclose a small, small specimen but this second of last June, I cut down a large tree for to send you larger specimens, which I shall send by first opportunity, John Bartram. 
and that's in 1736. Almost 20 years later, in October 1764, the Reverend Carl Wrangel made an early missionary journey through the pines to minister to the Swedes living there. While he was not a botanist, Wrangel was an observant traveler, and he provided a good description of the pine barrens at, that, at the time of his trek. Quote, the country hereabouts has been inhabited only during the last 20 years. Previously, there has been only wild barren ground between Philadelphia and Egg Harbor, so the travelers had to provide themselves with food for their horses and themselves when they came this way. The land sells for $10 a hundred acres, and the soil consists mainly of drift sand, which, however, produces reasonably good crops of maize and rye. But wheat does not grow especially fast. There are no meadows, but good wooded pasturage is available for the cattle throughout the summer. In the winter, they bring their herds to the seaside in Egg Harbor, where they pay, pay 10 shilling a head for the winter. They fetch hay for the horses from the same place. They have to depend principally on the woods, which consist here of spruce, pine, and cedar. For a livelihood, several sawmills are therefore located here, where, hordes, uh, where boards and building lumber as sawed and shipped partly by the river and partly by wagon to Philadelphia. They also make shingles here of cedar and they make charcoal. They also extract some tar. Oak also grows here, but there is no hickory. After dinner, we continued our journey and traveled 10 miles over a barren land, which is uninhabited since the soil is so poor. The road is completely level without even the smallest hills nor are, are there any rocks or other stones, except some small pebbles which lie among the sands. There are white, these are white and very fine. It seemed very probable that all this land was once part of the sea. This is supported by the fact that when they dig wells here, they often find oyster shells deep in the ground. In this land, there are found many conclusive proofs of the theory that the water is still receding here more than anywhere in the world. We crossed what, is, what the English call a cedar swamp, inasmuch as such a swamp consists of moss-grown mud with great many rivulets. Sawmills are commonly built beside such cedar swamps if there is adequate water for them. We finally caught sight of the Egg Harbor River, where there was a loading site for planks, boards, and shingles. Towards evening, we arrived at the home of a Swede named Carl Steelman, who lived by the highway Around his house were high fences on which were hung a considerable number of deer antlers. Like trophies, they witnessed that here dwelt a mighty hunter. After dinner on October 11th, I went in company with James Steelman and Mr. Robert Friend Price, Sheriff of Gloucester County, to a place called Little Egg Harbor. We arrived late in the evening and at the home of an Irishman named Elisha Clark, he lived in the middle of the forest where by the river called Little Egg Harbor, he had, both, he had built a saw and flour mill. In the morning after prayers and after we had eaten breakfast, we went out to see the place and the mills. About a half mile away, we saw the loading site on the river where more than 20 ships now lay to receive the products of the district. There was a tavern uh, run by an Irishman by the name of Westcott who appeared to be making money to the harm of others. We traveled over a sand barren, which was overgrown with a plant the English call myrtle, but it's kind of a porce. They use the berries to make the beautiful green myrtle wax. From here, Pastor Wrangell departed the pines and traveled out to Long Beach Island. The pine barrens continue to attract botanists throughout the 19th and 20th centuries as it does today. The year 1811 saw the discovery of the curly grass fern at Quaker Bridge. By the late 19th century, scientists made regular forays into the pines to examine the trees, the shrubs, and plants. Many modern botanists monitor and study myriad threat threatened and endangered species found in the pine barrens today. Okay, now we'll address charcoal cu culture. Many historians suggest charcoal production in New Jersey began during the early 18th century, although the presence of an iron works at Tinton Falls, Monmouth County, during the late 17th century, suggests that colliers plied their trade at that time. 
The world history of charcoal places its initial manufacturing in pre-dynastic e Egypt, about 3400 BC. Since the South Jersey Culture and History Center shortly will be releasing Ted Gordon's description of how a late 20th century collier in the Pines constructed his pit and burned it, and other descriptions are available elsewhere on the internet, I will not delve too deeply into the technical aspects of charcoal making. Rather, I would like to provide you with some information on the life of Pine Barren Colliers. Ironworks proliferated throughout the Pines, beginning just before the American War for Independence and into the early 19th century, when in heat, the furnaces had an insatiable appetite for charcoal as the iron masters converted bog iron into pigs and castings. Each furnace required a minimum of 20,000 acres of woodland to fulfill the need for charcoal with 1,000 acres consumed annually for iron production. By consuming 1,000 acres per year, theoretically the trees cut first will have grown back by the 20th year, allowing the cycle to begin again. Charcoal manufacturing occurred primarily in Ocean and Atlantic counties and the southeastern portions of Burlington County, although other areas saw limited production. Colliers used both pine and oak for making charcoal, but as anthracite became an accepted fuel in the 1830s, the need for charcoal manufacturing from oak diminished. Overall, however, charcoal production increased. Charcoal burners and their families, if married, were considered outcasts of normal society. During the middle 19th century, one journalist referred to colliers working in northwest Atlantic County as, quote, denizens of the scrub oak and pines. And the same journalist described their homes as, quote, built either of logs or slabs with but one window and one door. The hut was usually surrounded by huckleberry bushes, sumac, scrub oak, and pine. The interiors often had no floors. On Saturdays, the colliers came to town for a weekly supply of provisions and rum. They drank, quarreled, and fought among themselves all afternoon. And as soon as the sun went down, they loaded their supplies on the wagons and started back for the camps. In the 1840s, the American Tract Society, an evangelical Christian organization, began a systematic approach to distributing its literature and books. To accomplish their goals in New Jersey, the society obtained interns from the Princeton Theological Seminary to go into the hinterlands to spread the gospel. These stalwart missionaries known as Cole Porters crisscrossed the pines on several occasions, and Cole Porter George Washington Newell spent three months in Atlantic and Cape May County in May and August of 1844 a time when the bog iron industry was rapidly declining. In his report to the society dated March 17, 1846, he wrote, quote, a large portion of Monmouth, Burlington, and Atlantic County is destitute. This territory may be considered in three divisions, the country, as it's called here, the shore, and the pines. The shore, in many respects, peculiar. The timber is pine and oak generally where any is left. The wood and coal trade, formerly extensive and profitable, is now quite limited and brings but small gain. The pines have been the subject of much remarks and of several essays that have come before the public. This region is much the same in all parts from Squan, or Manasquan, to Tuckahoe. The iron and glass works in many respects resembles little kingdoms. The same is true of the coal and wood establishments. Atlantic County may be considered in two general divisions with regard to internal arrangements. First, the shore and adjacent parts inhabited by a farming, fishing, and seafaring community. And second, the interior part of the county. A small portion of this in, is inhabited by a farming community, but partially depends upon other employment. Most of the land in this part is in possession of the owners of the iron and glass works. Here is an, an entirely different state of, affair, of things in some respects. These proprietors are wealthy and intelligent, and their families usually well-educated at distant schools. At each of these iron and glass establishments, there are usually 12 or 15 families in the woods engaged in chopping and coaling. These are ignorant and without school. Although they frequently move from place to place in the pines, 
Still, the general, they generally prefer their present condition to any in which they would be, would be a better opportunity to instruct them. In the Colings, all live pro tem. In Atlantic County, the men generally have their families with them. It is very difficult to do much for the good of the coalers, for charcoal workers, and others in the pines in their present condition. No one is aware of one half of the difficulties until he has been among them and seen them for himself. The wood is generally gone, and if it were not, that from Virginia has precedence in, in the market. So the people are generally poorer than they were a few years back and likely to remain poor. Towns and populous neighborhoods can never be on such barren sand, end quote. And then on a final note, May 24th, 1844, Newell noted that he, quote, found five families in a coaling, uh, dwelling in cabins, found one of the families which had been burned out. Concerning the nature of colliers, an article appeared in the Trenton Evening Times during 1877, and it reports, as a rule, the charcoal burners are honest and form a good class of citizens, notwithstanding the mass of so-called humor shot at these New Jersey residents from the pop guns of the newspapers in nearby states. The colliers, even with their limited circumstances, are taken into consideration, are industrious, and oft times as well educated as many whose means form improvements are comparably better. We must at least give the charcoal burners credit for, for being the means whereby an industry invaluable to many manufacturers is, is perpetuated." End quote. Counterpoint to this previous statement is an article written a year later for the New York Daily Graphic. A reporter noted, quote, charcoal burning was until recently the most productive industry of the vast, sandy, stunted, pine-clad tracts of southern New Jersey. Proprietorship of such barren territory was an evidence of poverty. The small profits obtainable by turning the pine scrubs into charcoal were about all the territory afforded. And even that was almost played out. It is rather good for the state than otherwise that such is the fact. For conducted as it was, there was certainly, it was certainly a most wasteful industry. The rustic charcoal burner is a wasteful workman. He digs out a pit in which he stacks on end logs enough to make a pile eight feet high and 10 or 12 feet in diameter. This is covered with turf, if it is procurable or earth until the wood is wholly concealed. He then sets fire to it, and during its smoldering period, it must be watched without ceasing. At his work would go for, and all of his work would go for naught if sufficient air gets inside the, the, uh, the wood to bring the smoldering wood to a blaze. The uh, burner must be vigilant, closing up every spot where the smoke comes through with fresh sod. A few bushels of charcoal are all he gets for several weeks of severe labor. With the bog iron furnaces, while the bog iron furnaces were virtually all gone by the mid 19th century, charcoal production continued well into the 20th century with the charcoal sold for a wide array of uses, including beginning in the 30s, the barbecue pits that proliferated around South Jersey. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about the dance craze. During the 18th century, itinerant fiddlers began traveling the sugar sand roads of the Pine Barrens, stopping at the various taverns secluded in the woods to entertain the patrons. As the fiddler sawed across the strings with his bow, playing reels and other popular songs of the day, couples and strangers would spring to their feet and spontaneously begin dancing. Soon, Philadelphians of all ages learned of this opportunity to escape the oppressive moral strictures of urban life in the Quaker City. After crossing the Delaware River on a wherry to the landings in what would become Camden or taking a packet boat to Burlington, those seeking to cast aside their normal straight-laced lifestyles would undertake the arduous journey into the Pines to join with Jersey farm families and woodsmen to kick up their heels. This popular dance craze led to the passage of the New Jersey Immorality Act on March 16, 1798, when, which strictly forbid the presentation of, quote, interludes or plays, dancing, singing, fiddling, or other muse for the sake of merriment. 
on the Christian Sabbath or first day of the week called Sunday, end quote. This all had very little effect on those travens hidden away in the pines as evidenced by a seven page tract published in 1801 reporting on a Tuckerton resident named Edward Andrews who became a convinced Quaker and gave up a life of debauchery. The tract specifically reported that Andrews resident in, in the Jersey, quote, in the Jersey near the seashore among a wild sort of people, Indians and others, vain and loose in their conversation, fond of frolicking, music and dancing. Among these, he acted the part of the fiddler, end quote. Upon seeing the errors of his ways, Andrews resolved, quote, to break the fiddle in pieces, which when done, his heart rejoiced, and he felt a strength of hope rising in him that God would give him further power over all his vanities, end quote. Andrews, having destroyed his instrument, was, quote, made an instrument in God's hand. On June 22nd, 1809, a young Philadelphian named Sarah Thompson departed the city by ferry and stage for Tuckerton in the company of other family members and strangers. Nine in all boarded the stage, and the rear luggage pocket was stuffed full of bags, band boxes, bags without numbers, and one poor old man about 80 years of age. The poor soul was crammed in among the luggage to be sure he had a soft seat for the band boxes, they were flat enough. The stage stopped in Haddonfield and Evesham for a meal, and then the tavern at Quaker Bridge uh, for an overnight stay. The stage arrived in Tuckerton in time for dinner on June 23rd. Two days later, Sarah attended her first, uh, her first of several dances with her brothers staying out until 2 a.m. They were busy sparking. <laughs> on June 27, Sarah recorded, introduced to some fine girls in the evening, had a dance, enjoyed myself very much, end quote. On July 4th, after commemorating the day, Sarah, quote, had a dance in the evening, Eliza looked beautiful and danced till 12 o'clock, had plenty of cherry pie. End quote. On August 10, Sarah, quote, went after a fiddler, but the man's wife would not let him come. All really mad, had a great notion to go and tie the woman up and fetch the husband off. <laughs> Concluded a dance by her own music. Started for home at nine. Kept up a dancing until 11 o'clock, end quote. Sarah reported on August 26 that she heard, quote, talk of bringing the violin over and having a dance up at the tavern, end quote. The next day she reported, quote, could not get the fiddler. So we all danced, knocked in the head. Had a little kick up of our own in the evening, danced to Fisher's hornpipe, and what beat us was Judge Tucker, who tired us all out at dancing, end quote. Uh, moving forward through the 19th century, the dancing craze exponentially grew, requiring the construction of open air pavilions to accommodate the hordes of people who arrived to shake off their normal everyday sensibilities. The Greenwood Boarding House had such a dance floor up near, up near uh, uh, New Lisbon. In late July 1845, Edmund Morris, the editor of the Burlington Gazette, had the opportunity to see firsthand the crowds that arrived at Greenwood and at nearby Browns Mills to take every advantage of the amusements offered at these two recreational facilities, including dancing. As an invited guest, he rode in a carriage with three friends to Greenwood, and after a two-hour jaunt, he became amazed at the number of wheeled vehicles turning off near the Burlington County Asylum on their way to these two spots in the Pines. Some of the vehicles contain young men and women, the latter wearing white dresses, pink ribbons, and green veils. The, the covered farm wagons usually held a farmer, his wife, and a brood of children. Upon arriving at Greenwood, Morris observed that the boarding house itself was, quote, a large shingle palace standing solitary and alone just in the edge of the pines, about 20 miles from Burlington, at the termination of the Kinkora Railroad, end quote. Morris continued with his observations, noting, quote, leaving the house, you, will, you walk 100 yards into the woods, where the peculiar tastes of Jersey men are strikingly displayed. Here were two ten-pin alleys, crowded with players and lookers-on. Between them stood a long, roughly built shell of pine boards used for dancing. The sound of the fiddle and the shuffling of many feet indicated the dancing had already begun, and such was the energy of the Jersey girls that they were in continual alarm for the safety of their bustles. 
After the visitors consumed their dinners, the crowd returned to their vehicles and struck out for Brown's Mills, three miles away. Editor Morris followed along and after arriving at the new location noted, quote, but if Greenwood presented a lively scene, Brown's Mills exceeded it in every way. Here, five times the number of visitors were assembled. The woods were fairly jammed with wagons of all kinds, probably two or 300 being scattered about wherever there was an opening to tie the horses. Stalls or per, uh, preambulating pie carts were stationed about in various quarters, at which poor oysters and worse gin were in incessant demand. <laughs> at least 10 to 1,500 visitors were on the grounds exclusive of the regular boarders at the two houses at the mills. Here also were two, two ten pin alleys and two dancing houses all built of the roughest boards in the roughest manner possible and all crowded with players and dancers, the latter having barely room to exercise their legs among the shins of the admire, admiring crowd which pressed around the dancers on every side. Even the windows of these dancing rooms were packed with gaily dressed girls looking on with absorbing interest on the scene and drinking in with high relish the strains of music which proceeded from the well-worn fiddle strings of the great stimulator of the dance. The dancing was carried on with true Republican independence at small r. Some of the gentlemen danced in boots and hats, uh, some without coats, and many of the girls with bonnets and veils. As night approached, we left on our homeward journey, but we understand the evening scene is e even more lively than that during the day. Fires are then lighted up on platforms raised some 10 feet above the ground in various places throughout the woods and dancing rages with a perfect furor. So great is this passion for dancing that as we stopped at Wrightstown on our way home, we found the same amusement carried on at both the public houses there. In one of them, there was, a, there was dancing in three rooms at the same time, all to the sound of one fiddle. Now and then a girl was carried out exhausted by the heat and exertion, but a fresh hand supplied her place and the sport went on without interruption. And then the, uh, the editor finalizes his comments by saying, our own opinion is that a deplorable school of morals is opened by these gatherings. <laughs> As multitudes of young men and girls participate in them, we can readily understand how fatal they must be to the temperance sobriety and chastity of some who go into them, even with the best of intentions, end quote. In 1881, a Mount Holly resident traveled to Brown's Mills for the July 4th celebration and provided a description of what he observed, quote, pretty soon the squeak of a solitary fiddle was heard in the dance house and all hands adjourned thither to investigate the cause. It was found to be Mr. Mr. Richardson who had ensconced himself in a music stand and was playing a lively jig for a gentleman from the country whose pants were tucked in his boots and the perspiration streamed from every pore as he endeavored to keep time with the music. As soon as he tired out, another candidate stepped to the fore and began. Shouts and screams of laughter followed this display and the entire audience was convulsed. As each man appeared on the scene and gave up after a few minutes sojourn, he was succeeded by a fresh man anxious to distinguish himself. This sort of amusement was kept up until the supply of exhausted, uh, the supply was exhausted and then all adjourned for dinner, end quote. Now the fiddler was the dance master at the Pine Barrens taverns and dance halls. The names of most fiddlers are lost in the fog of history, but we do know a few, including Ellis Parker, born near Wrightstown during 1871. By his teenage years, Parker had become an accomplished fiddler who appeared on many dance floors with his fellow musicians, James Raymond, who played the harp, and Jake Walker, banjo player. The three merrymakers were euphemistically known as the Brindletown Orchestra. <laughs> After a barn dance, someone stole Parker's horse and cart with his fiddle in it. This loss led Parker into a public career as Burlington County's first master detective. <laughs> Another fiddler, Elvin Sweet, was a contemporary of Ellis Parker. He resided in Pemberton and played at area dances. Elvin also knew the very famous Pine Barrens fiddler, 
named Sammy Buck Giverson, who lived in what was Manchester Township, Ocean County, below Whiting. There are many stories about Sammy and his legendary fiddle playing. He was always the first fiddler requested for any dance. Sammy reputedly even encountered the devil near a bridge in the pines. And Charlie Daniels could have based his Devil Went Down to Georgia song on that story. On the day of his death, Sammy's fiddle disappeared and no one ever found it. Well, this ends my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. I'll try to answer any questions you may have concerning this talk.